Hello and welcome to another Solana tutorial. I've been sick for the past two weeks, but now it's finally time for part two of the Solana development course. Last time we did this. Just as a quick recap, we read data from the Solana blockchain. Most important thing here was the get account info. That's the one thing that you'll need to know how to get out information from Solana blockchain, how you read state. And today we're gonna, since this is done, do the second part, read data. So change the state of the Solana cluster. As last time, you can go over this in your own pace. Just go to solanadev.app slash course and hit the second part of module one. And I'm just gonna go through this in my pace and I'm probably gonna first go over a little bit of the basics with you. And then we're gonna go through this demo together. Right, so by the end of this class, we'll know what a key pair and transactions and transaction fees are. We'll be able to generate key pairs and generating a key pair from a secret key, such that it's always the same one. And then we will be able to create transactions that send Sol, sign those transactions and send them to the cluster. Oh, and with Solana Explorer, we also view those transactions. Oh yeah, it's also a, an important part here. Okay, should we do the TLDR? So the TLDR, if without reading this, would be a key pair. It's a combination of a private key and a public key. Really, internally, it's just a private key because the public key can be derived from that. And that is used to sign something, to prove the associated public key belongs to you, right? That this address, whatever is at this address belongs to you. And if we want to interact with a Solana cluster and change state, we need to submit a transaction via the RPC as we learned last time. It's another invocation of the JSON RPC API, just that it's not get accounts, but a different one. And a transaction can consist of several instructions and the instructions essentially are just the program calls, for instance, a system program call where you send some SOL around or a token program call where you send some tokens around or a custom program call where you do custom sh yeah, that's how this works. Anyway, we'll get to that in more detail. Oh, here's a code example, a transaction. Inside this transaction, there is an instruction. The instruction is a transfer instruction from the system program, which, you know, transfers Sol around, which is say from where, so from which public key to which public key we want to send how many Lamperts. Remember, Lamperts are just a billionth of a Sol. So that amount is the amount in Sol, and that's the amount in Lamperts. That's the amount we want to send around. And then we just send and confirm transaction with a connection. We also had that last time. And we put the transaction in there. And then we need to provide the signer, which in this case is our sender key pair. That is the corresponding private key or key pair, I say private key, to this public key. This is a pretty simple example, high level, how this stuff works. Right, let's go through this in more detail. The key pair. James, can you read this for me again, please? Key pair. As the name suggests, a key pair is a pair of keys, a public key and a secret key. Is used as an address that points to an account on the Solana network. Yeah, so we also had that last time. Addresses, public keys. <laughs> Same, same. So yeah, here we have it again. A key pair is a pair of a private and a public key. The secret key is used to verify identity or authority. You should always keep secret keys private. Oh yeah, that is a good point. That is a very good point. You should keep your secret keys private. Because as soon as somebody has the secret key, aka your key pair, they'll be able to act as you. As soon as a key is publicly known, like the one time I accidentally committed it to GitHub, that key is now publicly known. And now anybody can use that, so I can never claim it back. Like, you only need to know it and it can't be changed, right? You can't change the private key because that will obviously change the public key and therefore the address and all the data slash soul that's there. So of course you can make a new private key, but the old one is essentially lost. Get all the funds off of there and never use it again. That's also why it's so hard to reimburse the people from that 
recent hack where a certain wallet was logging private keys. And even if they had money from insurance to send out to people whose funds were stolen in that attack, they can't really because they can't tell who the actual people are because the keys are now out there and, you know, either the attacker or the real person could claim that and therefore it's no way... Anyway, keep your keys private is the point of this story. Moving on. Private. Let's actually jump into some code right away to play around with this a bit. And speaking of playing around, there is such a cool thing as the Solana Playground. Now I've never played around with this, but this could be super helpful for people who are just starting out. Like me personally, I like to have my stuff locally in my IDE and everything so I can manage dependencies. But especially for starting out, this can be so massively helpful because essentially you have everything that you need right here in the browser. Ooh, I even got two sol. Convenient, they already airdropped me something. Yeah, so point is we have a, a whole CLI and web interface here to build stuff. So why not work here? So that seems to be more for on-chain programs. Okay, so we might use that uh, once we get to the point where we actually build programs. But how about let's do it locally for now. No, thank you. Let's forget we ever did that. But yeah, the Solana Playground could be really cool for you to play around with. But for now, I'm just gonna go here and create a new file again. Form. Uh, from. I just can't spell, that's why. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so we can execute some code. Cool, 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 cool. Cool. Now, to that thing, generating a key pair. We're just gonna do that here. Key pair is in Web3, so we can just either say Web3 like this, or we do it convenient as last time and import it directly like that. Then we also don't need that import, so we just import them all like that. It's the cleaner version, I guess. So we have a key pair, we generate that, and then let's have a look what this key pair can do. Like our owner key pair dot, is that big enough for you? I'm gonna clear that because that looks ugly. I think it's big enough, right? Should we make it a bit bigger? Yeah, that's definitely big enough now. So what can this owner key pair do or what does it have? If we look here, it has a public key and it has a secret key. Who would have thought? Now the public key, this part, this is a public key in the sense of a Solana Web3 public key. This will give me the same as if I were to create myself a new public key. From, you know, and here I paste in the address from the key pair. You know what, let's print that. If I would like to print that, I would go to base 58 because that's how we like to see our pub keys. And then if I run it... We'll get to something new in just a second. Oh, I didn't save it. There we go. This is the public key. And I could also be like, create the public key like this. That is the same thing as that. Except if we run that again, it will not be the same pub key because keypair.generate generates a new one each time. So if I would also log this one, if I run it again, we will see that the first one is now different and the second one still the same. Run it again, first one will again be different because keypair.generate creates us a new private key every time and the public key is derived from the private key. So that's the public key. And then there's also the secret key or the private key inside this key pair. Now this is something that you should not log except for demo purposes. Don't ever put this in production. I'm speaking to you. Sol Flare. No, wait, how, who did it? Slope. Slope was the name. Looking at you, Slope. Good. That was a joke that took a while to make. Also, this will just give you the byte array, which is not particularly interesting, but we can again be... Oh, it doesn't allow us? <laughs> See, it doesn't want you to display it even. Let's see what that does. It doesn't even have a 2 base 58. There you go. So that is something that you might recognize as a Solana key pair, a collection of integer numbers, a collection of bytes, really. So that must be 64 bytes, if I'm not mistaken. No, is it 128 bytes? No, 64, huh, told you. 
<laughs> I said it from the very beginning, it's always I ever said. Uh, so 64 bytes of length in the secret key, that is used to derive the public key. Also, and that is the thing that you should not share with other people, right? As soon as somebody has that, they can use your key and pretend they're you. Now this is also what's inside the key files if we create them with Solana keychain new. Oh wait, let's define an out file ephemeral key. I should have called it dot json. Dot json. Here it also gives us the seed phrase, which is one step above. This can be used to derive the secret key. But anyhow, <clears throat> the secret key for this pub key is now inside this file. Let's open it here. So that's the same thing, another 64 bytes worth of secret key. So that's what the Solana keychain also does. It's also what it produces if we say Solana keychain grind, which I like personally. But we're again getting way ahead of ourselves. Point being, with keypair.generate, we can always create a new key pair. But since we now always create a new key pair, it's much more convenient to, you know, use the same one or load one. That's where this key pair from secret key comes in. To ensure that the secret keys are secure, we recommend ejecting it through an environment variable and not committing it to your env file. Like, are you saying we should not do what we're doing here? Yeah, that's what I'm constantly saying all the time. You shouldn't do as we do it here. <laughs> this is just demo. <laughs> and then people actually do it like that. So yeah, let's just do it with the key pair that we created. Instead of generating a new key pair all the time, we're gonna chase and parse some private key. And I wanna actually load this from a file. So I'm gonna be like import read file and we call the file JSON. Then we'll make this to a string. That's not a secret. So that's the, the number array. Then we pass it as a uint eight because we know it's just bytes. Because if we pass it JSON, then this can be all numbers. It's just, you know, TypeScript doesn't have bytes, it has numbers as a type. And then we make it a byte array, so a U8 array, and then we can pass that in to the key pair, to the from secret key. Because the from secret key, there, it takes a U in 8 array. And then we call that our owner key pair and remove this. And if we run that now, also 64 bytes. And oh wonder, oh wonder, it's the same public key as we had up here. Cool, huh? We can read a key file and this now, if we run it again, this will always be the same key because obviously we always read the same private key file. That's a good base for working uh, with Solana. We can already import our key pair. Cool stuff. Moving on to transactions. Right. Whenever we want to modify something on chain, we need a transaction. But James, please lay all your wisdom upon us. Any modification to on-chain data happens through transactions sent to programs. Uh-huh. One moment. Important to note here, because you suddenly speak of instructions, a transaction consists of at least one instruction. It can have several instructions. Theoretically, it can have unlimited instructions, except there is a total transaction size limit, which also limits the total number of instructions that you can have. So an instruction is a piece of a transaction. And a transaction, as the name would suggest if you're a computer scientist, but if you're not, then it probably won't, with all the instructions together, a transaction is still an atomic thing. So either the transaction goes through and all of the instructions are executed, or it fails and then none of it is executed. In database, it would be rolled back. And here as well, it's just never changing the state of the cluster if any one of the instruction fails. That's very important to note here. If we have two transactions, then the first can succeed and the second can fail, which causes some problems because when transactions get too big and you want them still to be either all or none, then you need to manually roll back or do something getting to the more complicated part. But for now, transactions instructions contain an identifier to the program you tend to invoke. Okay, so every transaction calls a program. 
Now, this can be the program that you developed yourself. This can be a program developed by Solana Labs, like the token program. And for everything, there's a program. Also, for sending Sol around, there it's the system program that also does creating accounts, sending Sol around. So whenever it's just handling accounts, that's the system program. That's the one thing that we need. The next thing that we need is an array of accounts that will be read from and or written to. So what accounts are, we said last time, you know, all of those the public key addresses. And in Solana, we need to specify them up front. This is very important for the runtime to be able to parallelize stuff. Parallelize? Parallelize? Make it run in parallel. Because if the runtime knows exactly which account this transaction needs, and more importantly, which accounts are written to, then it can optimize and run transactions in parallel that do not need to write to the same accounts. Or more general, that do not use the same accounts. Simplest example, of course, two transactions that use completely different accounts, we can run them in parallel because they don't interfere with each other. Only if both write to the same account, then we can't run them in parallel anymore. And if two transactions read the same accounts, then that's also fine because that can also be parallelized. As long as it's not changed, as long as it's not written to, then the runtime doesn't need to block it. Only when a transaction writes to a certain account and another transaction wants to read or write this account as well, then we can't run that in parallel. Then one must come first because that changes state. Yeah, that's why we need to specify those accounts up front. This is a specific thing to Solana, or at least that's not what's happening in Ethereum, which is why development there is a bit easier. But we, as Solana devs, we need to know exactly which accounts we want to use. Also, all of the programs that we use are also stored in accounts, thus we also need to list them as accounts. And then the third thing, oh yeah, James, please just continue data structured as a byte array that is specified to the program being invoked. Basically instruction data. So any amount of bytes that we want to give to the program to work with, right? So an instruction like this could be, for instance, the with examples of the transfer, how many Lamperts do we want to send? We encode that as a few bytes, four bytes to be specific. Is it four? Yeah, it should be four. Is that how my math works? Looking at fingers. Okay, moving on. When you send a transaction to a Solana cluster, a Solana program is invoked with the instructions included in the transaction. Well, I mean, several programs can be invoked. So per instruction, a program is invoked. Uh, this sentence, I guess, can be written a bit more differently. Not judging. You can create a new transaction with the constructor, new transaction. This is a very basics. It's something that I still use all the time. New transaction and then add all the instructions. That's the same all the time. Right, so there's some more code. Let's try it out, shall we? We create a new transaction. We create an instruction to transfer some soul from a sender to a recipient. And then we add the instruction. I mean, yeah, let's 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 do that. Let's let's copy that over. So Add all missing imports, so that's convenient. And the amount, I don't know, let's just use 0 0.1 sol. This is where we now want to use our key pair. And what I like to do, instead of using a, a different public key here, I just use our owner key pair dot public key. That's very often how I write it, if I have the, the key pair for it. This can be just a public key, because for the recipient, we don't need to have a private key. For the sender we do, because we need to sign, otherwise the system program won't, won't let us uh, subtract so solve from that account if we are not a signer. So where do we send it to? The recipient, this is just a new public key where we say this address. And that transaction is now ready to be sent. How do we actually send transactions? Once created, a transaction needs to be sent to the cluster and confirmed. And that we do with a send and confirm. There we go, that's what we need. We need a send and confirm transaction. Again, we import that from Solana Web 3. We need a connection, we still don't have a connection. Okay, so let's do as last time, new connection and there we can get the cluster API URL from mainnet better. I would usually recommend to use, you know, a, a private RPC or a Genesis Go one. But for these simple things, mainnet, the public endpoint should be enough. And the send and confirm transaction needs the connection. 
the transaction and then the key pair. So we call that one the owner. Oh, that's the signer, sorry. The signer, but the key pair, we want to sign with that key that we sent from. Otherwise it won't, it won't let us do that. And what we get back is the signature or the transaction ID, what I like to call that, but the terminology really is the signature of the transaction is that hash that represents the transaction if it actually hit the cluster. But it is a bit confusing terminology wise since this is the signer. But anyway, signature or transaction ID is what we get back here. Except what we really get back here is a promise for the signature. So as you can see here, this is a promise for a string and a string is the transaction ID. So what we would really need to do to actually get the signature here is await this, which we can't do we are because we're on top level. To fix this in an async function, let's call it main with no parameters. And then we just call main, boom. Then we can await it as well. And then we get the signature and then we can say console log signature. Now, if I execute that, it will fail. And it says, I know it's really not nicely formatted here, but the thing here is the transaction simulation fail. So it didn't even make that RPC call because when locally simulating that transaction, no, wait, we can't locally simulate that. We don't know the Solana state. So it must have made the RPC call, but then the RPC didn't push the transaction to the validators because it was like, ah, this is definitely not gonna go through anyway, so I'm not even gonna bother sending it to the validators. And then it also tells us why, attempt to debit an account, but found no record of a prior credit. Fancy for we don't have no soul on our account, which is true if we check Solana balance for our key, we have zero soul there. Now, one way to go about this is to say Solana airdrop one and we will suddenly, oh wait, 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 wait. Maybe if we did it on DevNet, I mean, we don't want to play on mainnet because we can't get airdrops there. But on DevNet we can airdrop like this, Solana airdrop. But another way to do it is to create an instruction that does us the airdrop. Just so we learn a little more and such that we do a little bit different than James is doing here. Let's do a little extra work. Before we make this instruction, we create a airdrop instruction. And this, I think is also in the system program. Where did I do that before? I mean, I can't call myself a Solana developer if I don't know how to airdrop. I mean, who does that? The Solana CLI. Well, let's look up how they do it. Oh, there we go. That's directly in the connection. So that's not even an instruction. Yeah, indeed. There's a request airdrop in the connection. Request an allocation of lambdas to the specific address. Okay, okay. But I'm not giving up. Okay. So what does that do? Unsafe result. Okay, so that's a direct RPC request. All right, fine. So that's not part of a transaction. Fine, let's not make it part of our transaction then. Let's just request an airdrop as you would. To owner key pair dot public key and the amount one times Lampards per soul. Then we have one soul, boom. That thing we await. Can we also get the airdrop signature? And then I wanna wait for this to be finalized and that don't really know how to do that. I mean, should we use that deprecated thing here? Transaction confirmation config. But what is a transaction confirmation config? You know what? Forget this. We're just going to wait for our airdrop. And then the transaction is still going to fail because it's not finalized at the point that it gets here. And you know what? I'm just not going to care. I'm just gonna run this anyway and get the same error. But now the airdrop has been requested and I can say Solana balance on definite for this key is suddenly one because the airdrop went through. Now we don't need that anymore. And we could have also just done it with CLI. And if we now run it again, yeah, looks good because if there's no error and we wait, then it's usually a good sign that it's going through. Yes. Now we get a transaction signature here. 
or as I like to call it, the transaction ID. And the 0.1 sol has been sent out. So if we check our balance again, we should have 0.9. There we go. We have 0.899999995 because 0.000005 sol was used for the transaction fee. So per signer, we pay 5,000 Lamperts, I think so. So 5,000 Lamperts per signer is the current transaction fee. Yeah, what can we do with that? Looking ahead already a bit, we can go to the Explorer. Did we do that last time? I think we did. And we can go on DevNet and then paste in our signature, transaction ID, in here. And we can see if we scroll down, the sender and the receiver, we can see that there, this is the transaction fee. So I pay the 0 0.1 that I sent plus the transaction fee. The receiver gets the amount that I sent. And that's essentially it. We can also have a look at the individual instructions. There's only one instruction in this transaction and it's from the system program, a transfer instruction and it returns success. That's all there is. So this transaction went through, it succeeded. We sent some soul on DevNet. Amazing. Back to you. Instructions, please read. When working with non-native programs, however, you'll need to be very specific about creating instructions that are structured to match the corresponding program. This transfer essentially hides listing the accounts that we need for the instruction and putting the instruction data in the right order and everything. That's all hidden in this dot transfer and we can just call it conveniently with just those three things. If we actually were super curious and check out the system program in the Solana Web 3 JS. By the way, this is something that I recommend people do. If they're curious what something does, just look up the source code. Transfer instruction generates a transaction instruction transfer parameters. So those things, that's the from blah, blah, and so on. So the params that store the from pub key to pub key. Maybe let's have a look at that. So that's the simple way that we use the from to and Lamperts. And then we could also have used it with from to Lamperts, but also a base seed and program ID if we weren't using the system program. So back to the actual transfer. This is the important part because we don't do it with seed. Essentially, it just creates then a new instruction with the keys. So that's the accounts, the program ID. So that's this program ID, the system program ID, and then the data that is just the encoded Lamperts. Oh, wait, no, it's the type. So the first byte is the which kind of transaction is it? It's a transfer instruction. So the transfer instruction, system instruction layouts transfer. So that's the first byte. And then the Lamperts are encoded as a big int. So four bytes, the next four bytes are the amounts of Lamperts. So that's the instruction data. So again, we have accounts, program, instruction data. That's what each instruction needs to have. Sound familiar? Accounts, program, and instruction data. Right, so what are the accounts then? This is what is conveniently hidden from us. So we have the from pub key, so that's the sender. He is a signer and we need to write to that. So we actually haven't really talked about that much, have we? James, are we gonna talk about that more later? Each account that we provide has two flags, whether it's a signer and whether it's writable. Let's start with writable. When the account changes, we need to flag it as writable, right? If we want to change the account, we need to flag it as writable. That's how we need to say it. Because otherwise the runtime will not let us change the account if it's not writable. Why? Well, because it wants to parallelize it. Parallelize it wants to make it run in parallel as we discussed earlier. And it can only do that if none of the transactions write to that account. So we need to say if we want to write to that account, because if we do, then it can't be parallel another transaction that also writes this account. Um, so that's, that's quite obvious. Why do we need those two addresses to be writable? Well, on the one we subtract the amount of Lamperts and on the other we add the amount of Lamperts. So both change state, 
so they both need to be writable. The other thing is the signer. And if we say signer is true, then it's checked that the private key for this public key has signed this transaction. In other words, it was added as a signer to the transaction. If signer set to true, but it's not provided in the signers list, then this transaction won't go through. It won't even simulate, because that's the entire point. Only the person who has the private key is allowed to change the amount of Lamperts. What it means that is signer is set to true is really up to the program. So in this case, the system program checks is the sender also a signer? Because if the sender is not a signer, then it will refuse to subtract Lamperts from his account. Adding Lamperts to an account, you can do whatever. I can send it to anyone, but for subtracting, the system program will check that the private key to that address has signed. But there's no real other meaning to the signer except for private key was present or private key is present. Private key has signed, but it doesn't change whether or not it's run in parallel. You can make an address a signer, which is completely useless. That is not required to be a signer. Then nothing happens, I guess. But if it's not a signer and it should be a signer because the program expects it to be a signer, then the program can decide, oh no, I will not execute this instruction because I require this to be assigned. Does it make sense? I hope it makes sense. I mean, I think you get the idea. And that's the manual way how we create such an instruction. We provide the keys, the program ID, and the data manually. I think this is also what James is gonna teach us next, I think. You can create non-native instructions with the transaction instruction constructor. This constructor takes a single argument of the data type transaction instruction to our fields. <laughs> Export type transaction instruction to our fields equals. Yeah, so there we have it again. We need to specify the accounts. We need to specify the public key of the program and we need to, or we can specify some instruction data. We don't have to add instruction data, but we can. This means you need to know the behavior of the program you are calling and ensure that you provide all of the necessary accounts in the array. I'm not having fun. What? I also didn't pay attention. What did you say? <laughs> To ensure, yeah, that's what we talked about earlier. We need to specify the accounts beforehand. And each of those things in keys. Whether or not the account is a signer on the transaction. Yeah, what does that mean, James? A Boolean representing whether or not the account is written to during the transaction's execution. Putting this all together, we might end up with something like the following. Okay, but he doesn't really explain it, does he? Okay, following example. We call a program. So it's just a query instruction that uses just one account and the program ID. So I don't need to put the program ID extra in an account. Do I get that right? I think I get that right. Other than that, I think that those are all the accounts that I, I mean, do we want to go through this? I mean, we can for fun create our own transfer instruction, but that would essentially be copying those lines of code. But yeah, I mean, I guess why not as a practice? I find that to be a nice practice. Let's do it. So. He was talking about using a transaction instruction constructor fields. And then he puts that directly in here. Manual instruction, because I set it up manually. Do you get that? Instead of bad name, it's probably a bad name. Who cares? We provide the keys, the program ID, and the data. And the keys, again, we're trying to copy this. So the keys will be first from, which is both a signer and writable. And then the second one will be my recipient, which is not a signer, but also writable. Those are the two keys. Web3 dot system program dot program ID. And the type of that was a public key. So that's fine. That should be the public key. And now we can also, in this case, we need to, for it to work, provide the data. And this gets a bit more complicated because we now need to encode it properly, but uh, I'm just gonna borrow some code <clears throat> from here. Let's see. Oh, 64 bytes, Lamberts, not 32. All oh, right, it's a big int. So 
8 bytes, not 4 bytes, but 4 bytes for the instruction. Okay, I mean, what did we learn? It's 4 bytes for the instruction, and I'm not sure what is in there, but probably the index. So this is definitely more complicated than we should do it a second part but I'm kind of just too interested and I want to kind of get it to work. So I'm just going to quickly try and get it to work. Essentially what we learned, we have four bytes of instruction and then another eight bytes for Lamperts. So let's just say our data, our instruction data, remind me again which type that needs to be a buffer. Can't be so hard to create a buffer. Allocate a new buffer of size. Ah, yeah, that sounds good. And the size is 4 plus 8. And then instruction data write. <laughs> We're going to manually write that data now, don't you see? Okay, 32 little endian. So little endian, Solana always uses little endian. And the instruction is number 2 and the offset is 0. And then we do the same for Lamperts, except that's a 64. Uns oh, unsigned int, please. Not integer. We want it to be unsigned int. And the offset is four because we write four bytes here already. And the value is Lamperts. And the Lamperts is that. Needs to be a big int. How do I make this a big int now? Ah, like this, maybe? Let's just try this. We're indefinite. We have this commented out and we have our manual instruction now where we put in the instruction data <laughs> and then we try to add this to our transaction, our manual instruction, and then we send that. Let's just try it. What could possibly go wrong? We're on definite anyway, so boom. I mean, looks good so far. Woo! Ah, I can't scream, but woo! <laughs> We sent another 0 0.1 sol. It's pretty much the exact same thing because we do nothing differently except have a much harder time setting up all of the accounts manually and the data. So isn't it convenient to have functions like this in the Solana Web3 library that you can just call and don't need to bother with that. But hey, I also wanted to learn something today. So I did that for myself. You are welcome. If you now also learned something great and if you're completely confused, maybe just stay with that for now. Cool, moving on. We'll be ignoring data. Yeah, I, I wasn't ignoring data. I wanted to get it to work. Okay, cool. Transaction fees. Transaction fees are built into the Solana economy as compensation to the validator network for the CPU and GPU resources required in processing transactions. Unlike many networks that have a fee market where users can pay higher fees to increase their chances of being included in the next block, Solana transaction fees are deterministic. Well, we also get a fee market, but like a local fee market that is based on the accounts. So only the accounts that overlap, those you can bid on. But anyway, that's uh, for a different topic. The first signer included in the array of signers on a transaction is responsible for paying the transaction fee. So this is also important because I didn't know that for the longest time. The first signer included in the array of signers. The order of signers is important because the first one will be paying the transaction fee. So I, I had I had an issue once where just swapping around to signers solved that. If this signer does not have enough SOL in their account to cover the transaction fee, the transaction will be dropped. That's what we had in the very beginning when it said can't debit. Solana airdrop one to get free test SOL in your account for paying transaction fee. Free test as well. All transactions on the blockchain are publicly viewable on the Solana Explorer. Yeah, we had that. For, yeah, we did that. that. When it occurred, which block it was included in, the transaction fee. And more! Yeah, to reiterate, when it occurred, the block it was in, I never need that, but yeah, there, that's the slot, the recent block hash, also nobody needs that ever, but you know, the, the important stuff is down here, the accounts and what happened to them and then the instructions. My opinion, the important stuff is down here. We're going to create a script to ping a simple program that increments a counter each time it has been pinged. <laughs> One, basic scaffolding. Let's start with some basic scaffolding. What even is scaffolding, James? Scaffolding. You're welcome to set up your project however feels most appropriate. 
but we'll be using a simple TypeScript project with a dependency on the at Solana slash web3.js package. If you want to use our scaffolding, you can use the following commands in the command line. I mean, while it's here, could do that. Yeah, let's just blindly execute some code that James provides. I'm gonna do that inside here as well. Boom. <laughs> Are you sure? Whoa. Oh, you don't like that? Then let's pretend we're on Linux. But now. What the hell is happening here? Somebody wanna explain what the hell is going on? Can't you just paste it all in one? I mean, I can execute it one by one, yes. Wow. See, that's one reason why you should not develop on Windows. This is just horrible. Anyway, if I press enter, does it execute all of them after uh, sequentially now? Cut out the after, just sequentially. Yeah, at least that looks good. I'm so small in this corner. I kinda wanna be bigger. Do I wanna be bigger? <laughs> I mean, why not? <laughs> I'm bigger now. Yes, yes, yes. Such that you don't see the time anymore. Yeah, I like being bigger. <laughs> That's cool. Why haven't I always been that big? Boom, there we go. Okay, and what did that do now? What did the message say? I don't know. I didn't check. And now we have... A Solana ping client in here. One last thing, just to demonstrate that one transaction can have several instructions because I just comment that out there here. So also add this instruction and this instruction to the same transaction and then fire that up. And just to also prove that we actually managed to get that to work and not just execute the same old code one more time. There, went through. If we look for that, now we have one transaction. So we pay one time that transaction fee, but we have two instructions, the same instruction, the same transfer instruction, where we transfer 0 0.1 sol each. There you go. Such that you've also seen a transaction with two instructions now. Amazing. Back to this. We now have the Solana ping client. If you want to match our code exactly, of course I want Johnny and I still want that copy button here. Then we need to put that into our, I'm just gonna replace it, whatever, whatever, whatever. Add the following to git ignore. See, I mean, I kind of like it that you provide me all of that. That will ignore the node modules and we won't commit. I mean, I won't commit anything to git here anyway. Right? Not like last time when I committed my private key. Dist and dot env. We don't want to commit that. And finally, add the following to the scripts on the package JSON. Our package JSON in the scripts, such that we can say npm start. And that would just ts node the index ts. Before we can do anything, you need a key pair. Let's jump in that index and generate one. Yes, let's always just copy code without thinking. Super easy. We generate a new key pair and we lock the secret key. What could possibly go wrong? And now we can say npm rum start because we've put that into the package JSON. But first we need to change directory into the Solana ping client. And then we can say npm start. Well, that didn't go so well, did it? Oh, because I didn't save the file, huh? Classic. Classic. Yes, yes, I meant that. Of course, I meant that. There's a typo in your freaking script, James. A typo. I just copied it. This, there. No. What? What? Oh, no, I made that typo. Okay, I take it back. Sorry, James. Sorry, James. You're great. You're great. You're a great guy. <laughs> Look, we have a private key. Yeah, can you still feel a bit weird? having people lock the private key and not saying that you should not do this. Do not use this keeper for mainnet operations. Only use this keeper for testing. Well, at least he says something along the lines. But also bad practice to lock private keys. Okay, copy the secret key from console into the env as a private key. James, something with the quotes doesn't properly work in your display. I think this should, should be just a double upper quote. But okay, let's take your private key. No, I take mine. I take mine. I take the one that I just created into the env as private key. And then this thing, this thing. Boom. There we go. Initialize key pair from secret. Essentially what we did earlier as well. So I'm going to quite quickly jump over that. And just copy some code. Now the ping program. In main, let's invoke that. And 
don't log a key pair anymore. And then let's create a function ping program. Create a ping program. Inside this function, we'll need to create a transaction, create an instruction, create a transaction, send the transaction. Well, that's what we already did. So that's pretty, can't be so hard. Right. So as you said above here, that's the part I didn't let you read because that would have made me crazy. Here, we're just gonna copy that as well because that's gonna just be like constants. Oh yeah, by the way, did you know that in TypeScript, James, you use uh, semicolons? Uh, apparently not. Apparently you have never heard of that before in your life. Yeah, you don't do that. Look, <laughs> I mean, you don't need to, but for some reason I want to have them. Now in the ping program, let's create a new transaction. So transaction program ID is a public key from the program address. Program data is the program data address. I mean, so far so simple. Now let's create the instruction, you know, and I <laughs> keep copying just the relevant part. I should go down to the very end and copy everything and not do it point by point. But yeah, that's essentially what we did earlier. So we uh, say there is one account that we want to manipulate and that's the program data pub key. And it doesn't sign, but it should be writable because we sign. Signing doesn't really mean, we don't have the private key of that, so we can't sign, but we can make it writable. And then the program ID is the second account that we need. And we don't do any data because it's just a counter that will increment by one, I guess. Add the instruction without any semicolons. Okay, fine. Let's not use semicolons then. But it looks so weird as if you would return everything. Yeah, let's add that to the transaction and then let's send the transaction. That's nothing, nothing new here. Let's, that's the exact same as we did above. Finally, let's invoke the ping program in the main. Yes, I just need that because otherwise I also need to do my semicolons again. Look, semicolon, god damn it. Oh man, this is... <laughs> now, there we have the connection request airdrop as well. Run the code and see if it works. So we're just gonna also airdrop that unexpected token at position three. Oh, that's not good. What did I put in here? As a number array. Or do you want that as an array? Yeah, because otherwise it's not a valid JSON. Okay, fine. Let's put it in as an array then. Oh yeah, that's what I would have expected because we don't wait for the airdrop to be finalized, but we now requested the airdrop, so now we're fine. If we now start it again, we should now send the transaction from our custom program or to our custom program. Finished successfully. There we go. Holy, somebody subscribed. Thank you. No, I don't see it anymore. Anyway, that's what you get for a recording with OBS. Um, so let's look at this transaction. Again, we paid the 5K Lamperts for the transaction fee. That's all we paid for the rest of the one sol we still have. And that is the account that we write to. And that is the program. And essentially we just called an unknown program. So that was our custom program. Probably James developed that. And it's just a, a ping program and it has been pinged for the 380th time. That's actually not too much. Not too many people are actually doing this class, I guess. But we're gonna change that because people are gonna do that class now. You people, you do that. And if we do it one more time, then it will be pinged the 381st time, right? Right. There we go. No data. Oh yeah, that's also interesting. No data because we didn't provide any data in here. We could have provided some data, but we didn't. Yeah, and that is how you interact with the Solana cluster, how you write data through the Solana cluster. I would say we're done. Yeah, I mean, that just makes it fancy that you don't... I'm, I'm okay with copying and pasting signatures, but yeah, one could do that. Wait, James, I want you to say that. And just like that you're calling programs on the Solana network and writing data to chain. Just like that. In the next few lessons, you'll learn how to Ooh. do this safely from the browser instead of from running a script. Mm. Add custom data to your instructions. Mm -hmm. Deserialize data from the chain. Yeah, so come back next time when we do all of that stuff. And I'm hopefully going to be not sick anymore. Challenge! Go ahead and create a script from scratch that will allow you to transfer saw from one account to another on DevNet. We did that. Be sure to print out the transaction signature so you can look at it on the Solana Explorer. If you get stuck, here's the solution code. James, I'm ahead. I already did that. <laughs> so challenge complete, I would say. And also part two of this module one complete. Wow, I'm too big. <laughs>
There we go. We've got the first two parts of module one done. Next time, we're gonna interact with wallets. Probably like, you know, those kinds of wallets. But thank you for joining me on this developer journey of uh, learning Solana basics. Once again, thanks to the Solana Foundation for supporting me to make those videos. And uh, thank you for joining me. If you have any feedback for me or James, things we should do differently, let us know in the comments below or on my Discord server. And I will see you next time where we interact with wallets. You can also check out those two videos. Subscribe, like the video and share it with all the people who might also want to learn Solana development. Yeah, go share it. Share it all. Share it all the way. Tag me on Twitter as well.